we'd introduced linearly constrained frameworks, which if you remember are frameworks where as well as having the usual distance constraints between points, say we're, if we just think about two dimensional space, then some vertices may have additional constraints that restrict them to move on some affine subspace, so, so a line, or even if there was, maybe there was two of these constraints and then there were a, a pinned vertex. So in, in this context, we're gonna try and, and um, understand some rigidity and global rigidity properties. So the, the first one is the two dimensional characterization of rigidity, which is due to Strano and Ferran. And I told you this at the end of Friday's lecture, but I'm just gonna repeat to make sure it's fresh in your head. So remember our linearly constrained frameworks have a, a graph, a map assigning positions to the vertices and a map assigning normal vectors to the vertex containing any loop. Okay, and the linearly constrained framework is generic if the entire set PQ is algebraically independent over the, the rationals. Okay, and such a, a framework in two dimensions is minimally rigid if and only if a nice combinatorial condition. So if you imagine you have a, a framework in 2D, then if there's no linear constraints, then of course you can translate in two independent ways and you can rotate. And that's the, the minus three you see in the sort of Le Mans condition. And so this is a sort of standard condition from the polycheck geringer Lamann theorem for all subgraphs with no loops. But if you allow loops, then say you had a one loop there and another loop there, so two loops at this one vertex, you can easily see that's forced this vertex to a specific location and hence it's ruled out both the translations. So the only thing left is the rotation. And then if you put a, a loop on this vertex, so another linear constraint, then you'd rule out the rotation as well. So we can get rid of all of the isometries and have our rigidity condition is that the only infinitesimal motion is the zero motion. So in other words, we have, we're in two dimensions, so it's two mod V for our count, but there's no minus anything, it's minus zero if you like because all of the isometries can be ruled out. There's no vectors that have to live in the kernel for any framework. So if we add up our edges and loops, we'll get twice the number of vertices for our minimally rigid framework. And we need a corresponding inequality for all subgraphs, whether they have edges or loops or not. But also, as I said, we are gonna have this stronger inequality when you have no loops. And as I explained last time, the point is here, if we didn't have such a, a condition, then things like K4, which we know are dependent, would be okay because they satisfy this inequality. So you can imagine you could have K4 plus two loops, but this will be a, it's not minimal and it's not rigid either in the linearly constrained context. The two loops will rule out two of the three isometries, but not all three of them. Okay, so hopefully everyone understands the, the statement. I, I don't have that much to cover today, so do feel free to, to interrupt with questions, even more than, than usual. Um, okay, hopefully hi, Tony. Ah, oh, my uh, volume is down, sorry. Sorry, if anyone was asking a question, my volume was down, but I think Alex is trying now, so I'm, I'm okay. Oh yeah, okay, I was just gonna say, um, I mean, is the proof as simple as you just described? Basically the minus three becomes a minus zero? Um, no. So, so what, what is as simple as I just described is if, if there is a, a spanning minimally rigid bar joint framework, so say something like this inside it, then it is generically as simple as if you have free loops in addition, you will become rigid. But we can have things that are, are flexible as a bar joint framework, but have more loops. And so, so dealing with all these cases at the same time, it's not quite as simple as just adding the right number of loops. You have to know that you can add in some, you can imagine you had a cycle on a, a million vertices and you've got to add many, many, many loops and check they're all independent. So it, it's not quite as easy as you said, but it's, I mean, it, it, it's a, a genuine extension of the, the polycheck Geringer theorem. Okay, thanks. Yes, so, but you are right that the special case where the bar joint thing is minimally rigid, we are, it, it is just follows for free that that part of the, the theorem is does just follow from the from adding the free loops to rule out the free isometries. Okay, so let's do the, 
the proof. I, I guess I, I want to do a maybe not the standard proof because I'm, I'm not going to present the proof that that Strainu and Ferran did. They did a um, they used frame matroids and it's sort of a matroid union kind of kind of proof. But I, I haven't been giving that kind of proof in this course, so I, I want to give a what I think of as a simpler proof from a, a recent paper with Jim Crookshank, Hakangula, and Bill Jackson. And it, it's simpler for the purposes of this course because it, it uses techniques we're familiar with in this course. It uses recursive constructions, it uses the zero and one extensions, and it uses red combinatorial reductions as well. Okay, so I will leave the easier direction that, the, that if you're minimally rigid, then the, the counting conditions hold as a an exercise and I'll prove the, the sufficiency to you. I think I haven't actually written that many words for the sufficiency, so I, I might have to draw some pictures as we go. So suppose we have a, a graph with a vertex set, edge set and loop set. I said this last time, but maybe I haven't emphasized it this time. I'm deliberately keeping the loops separate from the edges. So E is just non-loop edges, no multiple edges, just a nice simple, simple edges. And L is the set of loops. So my looped graph has total count on the number of edges and loops, an inequality for all subgraphs, and an inequality for loopless subgraphs, as usual, with at least one edge or at least two vertices, whichever you prefer to say. Okay, so what's the, the minimum degree in such a graph? Well, the number of edges plus loops is equal to 2v, so the average degree is exactly 4, but we don't have to deal with a, a sort of degree four kind of move. We're still going to use degree two and three kind of moves because we're going to move from thinking of degree to thinking of the number of incident edges. Why? Because a, a loop adds two to the degree, one for each edge, at least if you want handshaking lemma and, and things to, to work. But what re we really care about in our rigidity kind of, of graph moves is the number of edges that you throw away or the number of edges you add in in one of these operations. So. For example, if you look at these two pictures here, this is degree two, this is degree three, but they're both really the same operation. I take some graph that maybe includes u or u and v, and I add a new vertex x and one, two incident edges in either way. And so this is kind of a zero extension regardless of what the actual degree is. So we're gonna to move to thinking about the number of edges, incident, edges and loops incident to a given vertex. Okay, and so because of the, the two in, the, in these um, positions, the minimum degree will be at least two. And while the average degree is, is four, the number of incident edges to any vertex is strictly less, there exists a vertex with at most two or three incident edges or loops to it. So some of those could be degree higher than four even, because so this has got one, two, three, four, degree five, but it only had three incident edges. And so our options are the, the ones you see in, in this row. We could have a, a standard vertex of degree two or three. We could have a slightly stranger vertex of degree three. We could have a vertex of degree four or five, or even just a, a single vertex incident to two loops itself, but that would be in a separate connected component of the graph, otherwise it would have higher degree. So I, I guess this is a, for something I haven't really mentioned, is that in one of these linearly constrained frameworks, you don't have, because there's no isometries after we, for example, if you go back to this picture, we ruled out all of the isometries. So there's no reason why connectivity is necessary for rigidity anymore. So this, this in blue, that framework was, was this graph. That, and that's rigid. Another example of a rigid graph is a single vertex with two loops because that just says the two linear constraints in the plane intersect in a fixed point. So now this entire graph here is rigid. Uh, this, this is locked in, in place in any generic realization and so is the triangle. So even though it's not a connected graph, I can't do what I can do in bar joint world, which is fix one and just translate the other and get a trivial infinitesimal motion that shows it's not rigid. So I can be rigid without being connected in linearly constrained frameworks. So if, for example, this, this kind of picture. Okay, so, so back to our degree things. These are all the options if you just um, think it through for yourself. You, you need to have either two or three incident edges or loops and you go through these various options. In the case where you have two incident edges and loops, so that's this one and this one, then exactly as I was saying before, this is a zero extension, zero reduction kind of argument. So we remove X and 
we get a smaller graph that because we removed a, a vertex with two incident edges or, or edges and loops, we're still in the same combinatorial class. We still satisfy our conditions. It's not so hard to see. We've reduced V by one. So this side goes down by two. We remove either two from here or, or one from here and one from here. And similarly to the, the inequalities all, all work out. Okay. And then from that, we can say, well, the smaller graph is rigid by induction on the number of vertices. And then we use a zero extension argument. Okay, it's very slightly different when it's this kind of zero extension, but the same proof we talked about when we did the polycheck geringer lemann theorem um, works in this case too. So we can suppose there are um, exactly three incident edges. So that's this picture or this picture or this one. Um, and what, what we can do, so let's first of all talk about, this is the usual one. So we've seen this one before. So we're gonna delete this vertex and we're gonna add one of the three edges. So this is just a standard one reduction. We're in the class of graphs where we already thought about this, this problem before we introduced linear constraints. So we just use the same ideas. I won't go through it now, but if you look back at, at that, um, so you just do this, basically the same argument. And you also have to check that this inequality is satisfied, but it, I'm just gonna say it's not so hard to, to check that either. And so we can find a one reduction at any such vertex like this one to a smaller graph that satisfies the conditions, check both inequalities must be true for at least one of the three possible reductions. And then again, by induction, we have a smaller graph in the class. So we know the smaller graph, graph is rigid and hence we can use the one extension preserves rigidity to see that the, the bigger graph is rigid. Okay, so looking at, at our options, We've now, we've now dealt with these ones and with this one. So we're left with the case where our vertex with three incident edges is incident to a loop. It's either incident to one loop or to two loops, okay? And if it's one loop, it's two simple edges. If it's two loops, it's one simple edge. Okay, so this one, let me say it in a, a bit more detail. <coughs> so we have one of these pictures we have a vertex, I've, I've changed the, the letters, sorry, from what I had five minutes ago. So I have a, a vertex V with three incident edges. It's either two edges in a loop or two loops in an edge. And what I want to do is delete V and its three incident edges and loops and add a loop at a neighbor. So if it's only got one simple edge, my only option is to add a loop at X. If it's got two, I've got two options. I could either do this one or I could have added a loop at Y instead. And we call this a, a looped one reduction. And the inverse operation where you start down here and you delete a loop and add a new vertex with either one or two simple edges to the en end of the vertex you remove the loop from plus possibly one other and then one or two loops depending on which one you're in will be called a looped one extension. Okay. So this looped one reduction adds a loop. So if we go back to our combinatorial condition, this inequality only cared about number of edges, so can never fail. When we add a loop, we can never, we don't add anything to the left-hand side here, so this inequality can never be violated. So the only problem can be is, is if we violate this inequality. So we add one, one loop here, and if that causes a problem in some subgraph. Okay, so that's what I say here. It's easy to check that the res result of a looped one reduction is not sparse if and only if that condition fails, which means there's some subset X of V without the vertex we're getting rid of, such that the number of edges and loops induced by that subset is equal to, to two X. So when we add the loop here or here, we get one extra and we violate the, the inequality. Okay. If V was incident to two loops, then I claim such a set cannot exist. So what, what happens here? So we'd have an X in V minus V. So it would have to contain X and we're gonna add a loop to it. But before we do, we know I of X is equal to twice X. So if we just look at in the, the big graph, including this, when we add V and it's 
free incident edges or loops, we would find that x union v, the number of edges induced there, is 2x, sorry, I don't really quite have enough space, let me just move that across, is 2x union v plus 1, because we added one vertex, but we added one, two, three edges, so we added, needed to go to this, and this violates the inequality we have. So this set x like this can never have existed, which means if we have a vertex like this vertex v here, we can always do this reduction and we're happy. That reduction will keep us inside the combinatorial class. I'll talk about the rigidity step in a, in a moment, but at least for the reduction step, we're happy. So we must be in this case, okay? In this case, we can make exactly the same argument if the set x over here happened to contain both x and y because here we'd have a 2x edges or edges and loops, and we'd add one vertex and one, two, three edges and loops, so we'd get the same 2x plus one. So the only problem we have to deal with is if the set x looks like this, does not not containing y, and then we think about the reduction of v adding y, and so then we'd have the same issue there, and we'd end up with a set y like this. So the only real thing we have to do is worry about x union y in this case, okay? So if we want to reduce v and add an e, a loop at x or a loop at y, then the problem is if there is a set that is already too full containing little x but not y and another set containing little y but not x. However, if you have such a set, then i of x union y is equal to 2x union y this is just that they're disjoint sets, so you can just count up edges and, and, and loops in them and add them together. So it's, this is not hard at all to, to check. And hence you do the same contradiction. If such a set exists, then x union y plus v adds one vertex, but one, two, three edges and loops. Okay, so let's, let's see that a bit more written down. So if v is incident to one loop, then either x and y are in x, and it can't exist, as we just said, we'd add V and the free incident edges and loops to find a contradiction, or Y is not, and hence we can consider the other reduction at V that adds Y instead, and this gives us another blocking subset Y contained in V minus V with the same count, and this time with a Y, and then X union Y has the, the total count and we get a contradiction by adding v back again. So what, what I'm saying from all that is, if v has one loop and two simple edges, it must be possible to do a one reduction adding one of the two loops, that one of the two must keep us within the, the combinatorial class. So in our final two cases, not that you can see much of the picture anymore, but whether there was one loop or two loops, we can always do a reduction that deletes our vertex with three incident edges and loops and add a loop among the, the neighbors. So this looped one reduction must always work. Okay, but the looped one reduction is different to a, looped one extension, sorry, is different to a one extension. So we don't yet know it preserves rigidity. So how, how do we, we show that? So if we can show it that one extension preserves rigidity, we're finished by induction again, and actually we've finished the proof of the theorem. So, uh, I, you can see that I, I, I'm not proving, going to prove it in detail. I'm just giving you a, a very brief hint, basically, that what we're going to do is if you remember for the usual one extension, so let's draw a picture at the side. So the usual one extension took an edge x, y, subdivided it by a new vertex v that we put p of v exactly on the midpoint of the line through p of x and p of y. And we used this with the edge x, y kept to say this gave us a, a circuit. This collinear triangle was a minimal dependent set in the, the two-dimensional bar joint rigidity matroid. And so we could do the, the one extension. Remember, in our one extension, there'll be some other vertex z that this becomes adjacent to. We can think of it as a zero extension adding v adding say like that degree two vertex as our addition. And then we can use the fact there is a, a collinear triangle 
on these three vertices to say whichever one of them we delete, we preserve the, we, we don't change the rank of the rigidity matrix. The zero extension told us the rank went up the full amount it possibly could. And then we can just add this one in for, for free because it creates a circuit and we can take this one away for free because it just removes the dependence from the circuit and doesn't change the rank. So that was our little collinear triangle argument we did for one extension before, very briefly. And it's claiming to you that exactly the same argument works. And what we do here, we have a, a loop and we remove the loop and we add a, a new vertex and a loop. And then the final edge is either another loop or it's an edge. But whichever of these two it is, is irrelevant for the argument. It's only going to play the role that this edge from PV to Z played, which is just to give us a zero extension. And it doesn't matter if our zero extension looks like Sorry, it doesn't matter if our zero extension looks like that or like that. It's just one of the one of the two cases I talked about a few minutes ago. So how what do we do? Well, we keep the loop that we started with and we have our new vertex here and new loop. So that two vertex graph with one edge and two loops, i.e. this one, generically it's independent like a triangle is, but we pick a special position where it's a circuit. And the special position is where the two linear constraints are, are parallel and we have a nice right angle for the, the edge. So the edge is actually the exact distance between these two parallel linear constraints. And so it shouldn't be so hard to see that this, this is dependent. If you, you want to write it out as a, a matrix, I guess what you do is you have PV and you say, so this is V and this is U, PU is, PV plus the, the normal vector at V. So the normal vector that gives you the linear constraints, just add it on and put the same normal vector over here. And you can just see you have a little um, matrix with three rows for your rigidity matrix for this particular graph. And you'll see it's easily dependent. Okay, so that's the end of the, the proof of their, their theorem. Any questions on that? Okay, so, oh, I should check in case there's anything in the chat. No, there's not. Um, so I said at the start of the theorem that we we're talking about generic linear constraints. So the P and the Q were both generic. In this two dimensional theorem, you can actually improve that the theorem to remove that assumption and just have generic points, not, not need the linear constraints to be generic. Particularly, this is interesting because you can imagine the linear constraints are pinned vertices that make me come up in applications or maybe you, you force some, something to move along a, a track, say. And so you might want to say in advance, these are where my, my linear constraints are because they, they model the, the boundary condition of some, some um, particular real world situation. And so th this kind of motivation led Cato and Tanigawa to Im improve the theorem um, that we, we just said to allow non-generic linear constraints by saying in advance, I'm gonna have these predetermined linear constraints and then the counting condition depends on the linear constraints. So for example, if I, I give you some, some particular graph, but I say that every vertex within the graph that contains a, a linear constraint, they're all, all those linear constraints are parallel, then now I can translate everything. And so the, the E plus L equals 2V condition is not right anymore because we definitely have a motion that we can't rule out. So depending on the predetermined choice, the counting condition has to change a bit and depend on the on that. So that makes their, their result more complicated to describe. So I, I'm not going to go into, into any more details than that, but just this is a, a nice reference that does this. And they do some other things as well, some other higher dimensional um, boundary conditions in, in the linear constraint context. In fact, I mentioned one of them just about now. I talked, and in fact, for Alex's question is relevant to get again here. So in, in 2D, a special case that was true is that you take your understanding of a bar joint framework and you understand a particular linearly, kind of linear constraint framework when there are exactly three loops. It doesn't really matter where you add the, 
the free loops so, so much. And so understanding linearly constrained frameworks with exactly free loops tells us the other way as well about bar joint frameworks in the plane. So if I go up to dimension three, since we don't understand bar joint frameworks generically, we're not going to understand linearly constrained frameworks because it includes the bar joint framework as a special case. So it, it's going to be too much to ask for a full characterization without um, a substantial step towards the, the, say the 3D rigidity problem, for example. But if you go to, to special cases, some results are known. And so I, I want to, to mention those uh, a little bit. So the same paper by Kato and Kan Tanigawa they give results for body bar frameworks. So I don't think I've mentioned body bar frameworks in this course, and I probably won't, even though it's kind of on the, the outline still, um, but I probably won't get to them. But you should think of those as, instead of having bars and joints, where the joints just um, join two edges, you could have larger rigid bodies that then could be connected by, by many edges. Or if you like, you, what you could think of is that each of these bodies is really a, some sufficiently big complete graph and you, you have a, a graph with lots of, let's say we're in 3D and you have lots of, I don't know, K5 subgraphs and you're interested in how you can connect them up in a way that makes the, the whole situation rigid. And so this is kind of intuition for body bar frameworks. And if you add linear constraints or boundary constraints to, to these things, then Kato and Tanigawa can give a, a nice characterization. Okay, so I, I want to next mention one more result for linearly constrained frameworks in, in D dimensions. But as I say, we can't solve the, the D dimensional rigidity problem in, in general, so I need an extra hypothesis. And the hypothesis I want to add is that we have sufficiently many loops, so in particular, sufficiently many loops at every vertex of the graph. So each vertex is going to be constrained through these loops to move not in RD, but in a sufficiently smaller dimensional affine subspace, and then we can do it. So I first looked at this problem with um, Jim Cruikshank, Hakangula, and Bill Jackson, but a, a more recent paper we gave a, a sort of improved theorem, which was with Bill Jackson and Shinichi Tanigawa. So what our theorem says is that, well, it, it actually applies in the plane, but we, we we can think about it for a dimension at least three. But if, if you make every vertex incident to at least this number of loops, so say you reduce the dimension by half basically, then you can characterize rigidity as a linearly constrained framework as exactly those graphs that have a spanning subgraph where the number of edges plus loops is equal to D times the number of vertices. That's common with the, the theorem of Strano and Ferran for the plane. But the only other, other counting condition, we have there's a minor condition at, at the end, but the counting condition is just the number of edges is at most, number of edges plus loops is at most d times mod x. Again, that's common with before. But notice I've thrown away the condition that i of x is at most 2x minus 3 for simple, i.e. loopless subgraphs. The point here is I've got so many loops that I don't have to worry about say three dimensional double bananas and, and violating the the three x minus six count or in general the dx minus d plus one choose two because i've chosen so many loops everywhere that i become sparse for free from the the combination of the the loop constraint and these constraints okay but i do have to be slightly careful because my my floor of d over two allows for example um, frameworks in three-dimensional space where there's exactly one loop at every vertex and here k5 becomes an issue so what it turns out in general is that there is a specific small graph that violates the the count you would want but isn't ruled out so I just said it could rule out these things but it's except in one very special case where you just have this one particular graph which can't occur as a subgraph so you have to be K5 free when you're in, when um, we're in R3, et cetera, in, in KD plus two free in RD. And, and also because we want to have the subgraphs to have this specific number of loops as well. Okay, so that, that, that is a bit more complicated and I'm not gonna go into any of the details, but just saying we, we can solve it 
um, if you have sufficiently many loops at every vertex. So for example, if you, um, in my, if you believe, say, some physicists who believe we live in 20 something dimensions, then we, we can solve the three dimensional rigidity problem by embedding it into a 20 something dimensional space and having lots and lots of loops everywhere, except for the three dimensions you, you want in some sense by having a, a theorem like this, but that's um, probably even too vague to, to but it, and it's more of a jokey comment, I guess, as well. So next I want to comment um, a little bit on global rigidity for linearly constrained frameworks. So again, we can have the same sort of natural definitions. We want to be unique instead of, and now we really do mean unique because there are no translations or rotations or reflections. So we just want to find that the only way to draw the graph in the given dimension subject to the edge length constraints and the linear constraints on the, the loop vertices is, is the, the, your drawing is the only one possible. Okay, so for this, it turns out that we still care about redundant rigidity and we still care about a connectivity condition. By redundant rigidity, I put the definition just to, to make 100% sure you, you're clear what I mean. We want to be rigid after deleting any edge, but also after deleting any loop. So the loops have to be redundant as well as the edges. And the connectivity condition is actually a little bit different. So it does not, so say we're in the plane, we know for global rigidity that you have to be free connected because if as a bar joint framework, if you have a two vertex separation, you can um, take a line through the, the two vertices and flip one component over, reflect through that, that line and you get a second equivalent but non-congruent realization. In the linearly constrained world, we can allow two vertex separations because the loops can help us. So we say that a graph is debalanced if for every subset of the vertex set of size D, every component of G minus X has at least one loop. So notice I, did, I didn't talk about X, this set of size D being a vertex separating set. It could be that G minus X is just a connected graph. And that would be saying, what, we, what you're saying there is you don't want your D loops all to be so you don't want your loops all to only sit on, on D vertices. So if you're in the, the plane, you, you don't want it to be true that you, all the loops you have in your graph sit on these two vertices, because if they do, then what's in the, the rest of it, you can do the same argument as here. You can put a line through, through here and flip this part over here across the, 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 the cut. Well, this is not a cut because there could, there could have been a difference, but you don't want to have all your vertices, all your loops only on two vertices. And similarly, if you have a, a two vertex separation in your graph, that can still be okay for a globally rigid framework if on both sides, you have at least one loop. So the, the loop over here would mean that this vertex moves on this fixed line and the loop over here says this one moves on this fixed line. So this is going to prevent, unless you have some non-generic coincidence, the, the reflection you would want to do through the line through the two vertex separation. Okay, so hopefully at least the, the sort of intuition for, for this is okay. Um, the proof that redundant rigidity is necessary, actually I just wanted to, to, to draw one little picture to, to comment on, on this. So imagine we have a rigid but not redundantly rigid um, linearly constrained framework. So what that could look like is like this. So I have this vertex of degree two. So it's, it's rigid if, if this thing is rigid because I've done a zero extension. And this thing could even be redundantly rigid, but the whole thing is not redundantly rigid because if I delete either one of these two edges or loops, then I will become flexible. If I delete the linear constraint, the vertex just moves on a circle centered over here and that we're happy. But if I remove this, this edge, then the red vertex here is free to move along this line and it can move along this line forever. So that the configuration space, if you remember back to our redundant rigidity lecture, an important step was that the configuration space was bounded. 
And that's just not true anymore because this, this vertex moves infinitely along, along this line. So you have to deal with this as an, an additional complication, but it's, it's not too hard. And here's the theorem from recent work with Hakangula and Bill Jackson, where it's basically an extension, a generalization of the, the two-dimensional global rigidity result to include these linearly constrained frameworks. And the generalization, the special case of the bar joint frameworks is like, again, with answer to Alex's question, if you take something that's redundantly rigid and free connected as a bar joint framework and add sufficiently many loops, which would be at least four in this case, then, then that case sort of has to fall out of our proof as a, a special case. So again, we need, to, we need to, to worry about whether you need to be connected or not. So the, the reason I'm highlighting that in the statement here is not because it, it makes things particularly complicated, it just makes a statement more complicated. So for example, this graph is globally rigid. So multiple copies of this graph are also globally rigid. And then you could have a sort of non-trivial globally rigid thing, which maybe it looks like, like this. And the whole thing is globally rigid, the, the whole union of them. But it's even more complicated than just thinking about each connected component because this one is also minimally rigid because if, if I have a vertex with two linear constraints and I remove one of them, then you're free to move on a line, just like we had over the here. So if you have us just a single vertex, it's a bit odd. So let's say we're a connected graph with at least two vertices and we're generic. Then the framework is globally rigid in two dimensions, if and only if the graph is too balanced and redundantly rigid. So th these are conditions I, I already dimensioned. I'm not going to say anything about the proof, I don't think. So uh, you, you can think of it as following the same strategy we went through in detail for the Jackson Jordan paper, but there are, are particular complications, especially combinatorially, that come from having the two inequalities, the i of x at most 2x minus 3, and the, the uh, at most 2x when you include the the loops. So this is an E union L. So having the two different ways that you can cannot satisfy the combinatorics leads to, to some complications. I wanted to mention this next thing, not because I think it's, um, it, it, it's sort of not necessarily something that would naturally fit in a, a graduate course, but I want to ask the question in case someone has an, a, an idea, and so I, I couldn't stop myself from throwing it in. So linear constraints in some sense, you can think of them as being a, a spherical constraint, where the, the center of the sphere is, is the point at infinity projectively. Mm -hmm. So you might also consider spherically constrained frameworks where the, the center of the spheres is a finite point. So these would be, instead of having a linear constraint from a loop at a vertex, the loop could constrain the vertex to move on a fixed d minus one dimensional sphere instead. Infinitesimally, as we talked about last time, frameworks on the sphere, you think about the constraint for the plane tangent to the sphere. So the same thing is, is true here. So infinitesimally, there is no change at all. The infinitesimal constraints are the same for linearly constrained as they are for these spherically constrained. And that's, that's just easy. However, for global rigidity, it's poten they're potentially at least different. So if I have a, a framework including GP, you, I guess, and the location of vertex V is here, if I want to find an equivalent but non-congruent realization as a linearly constrained framework, I have to find some other point on this line through the point PV in my equivalent framework. G, 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 sorry, I need to change the letters, I guess. So maybe I want to make, maybe, yeah, I should stick with GPQ and call this P dash. So in my equivalent framework, GP dash Q, where I'm taking the same linear constraints for both, I want to find a different P dash on the same line. But if I move to the spherically constrained case, then I want to find a different P dash on the circle instead. So at least it's conceivable that, that these questions are different, right? So whether you're globally rigid as a linearly constrained framework or as a spherically constrained framework may well be different answers. In the, the two-dimensional case, we can prove that they're the same. Sorry, Alex, go on. 
Um, so, I mean, could you just think of this as a graph with one extra vertex and then another edge constraint? For the, the spherical model? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that that's kind of how our, our proof goes, but it, it it, it needs more than that as well. So you're right that if you have a spherically constrained one, you could put, make a new graph by adding a, a vertex here, pin the vertex and put an edge constraint to, to P of V and then forget that the P of V had a, a linear, a, a spherical constraint. And you could do that for every single um, loop that was a spherical constraint in your original graph and move from spherical constraints to linear constraints. It, and then you'd have to solve a linearly constrained problem with lots of vertices like this. And so that's, that's how we, we show that for two-dimensional spherically constrained, you get the same answer. You get balanced and redundantly rigid. But I, I don't think, and maybe I'm just remembering wrong, but I don't think this gives us a, a, a full an answer in terms of understanding what, how to do spherically constrained global rigidity apart from by using a two dimension, the, the fact we know more in two dimensions from the combinatorics. So I don't think this tells us, for example, that that, that glo spherical and linearly constrained global rigidity are equivalent in all dimensions. Now, now you say it, I, I'm sort of worrying as to why. So I, it, I should read, read my own paper at the end in case I've forgotten, but this is the, I think this is still an open question. Okay, so I have eight minutes, and, and since nobody is um, jumping in for a further comment there, I want to quickly mention one more thing that, that's very distinct from what we've just been talking about. And it's it's kind of a, a, a small oddity that, that maybe is just saying things that you know, but again, asking a, a question towards the end, but just to fill in the, the time, because I didn't think I had enough for the, this hour. And I want to talk about independence in the d-dimensional rigidity matroid for k-regular graphs, okay? So what's the point here? Well, we, we know if there's a vertex of very low degree, we can just do this zero extension, zero reduction thing, and everything's easy. You just, you, you can just not have to worry about vertices of degree at most d, because you can just throw them away and you're independent if and only if you were before you threw it away. And it's also easy if you have a very high degree vertex, i.e. a maximal degree vertex, because we have the coning result. But in, in the middle, there's obviously lots and lots of complications. So I, I want to just to, to comment on the extreme where instead of having anything low or high degree, all the vertices have the same degree and see what happens there. So you're a regular graph. I can't really talk about rigidity in this case because we know minimally rigid graphs have to satisfy this equation. And that means that if you satisfy this and you're K regular, you'd just be able to work out, oh, I'm exactly quite a small graph. And, and then you could study it quite easily because it was very specific. So I want to focus on independence. So now if I'm independent, then I know I have an inequality. And so there's much more, so I can have graphs of, of whatever size you like, as long as, um, for example, you don't have the silly things like wanting to have a, an odd number of odd degree vertices. Uh, in your k-regular graph. So now I'm thinking about independence instead of rigidity. When is a k-regular graph independent? We know the answer for all graphs when d is at most two, so forget about that. Uh, I say last lecture here, it's not the last lecture. A while ago, we saw a result of Jackson and Jordan that said every connected graph with minimum degree at most d plus one and maximum degree at most d plus two was independent if and only if it was sparse, okay? So that immediately tells us the answer. If our k regular graph has, it well is d, k is d plus one. So our k regular graph has k equals d plus one or even at most d plus one, but at most d we already talked about was easy as well. It's still just independent if and only if it's sparse. So K regular graphs so far up to D plus one are nice and easy. If we take dimension at least four, we can see that um, K regular graphs are hard in the sense that they don't satisfy this thing. So I'm trying to look for when this is true. 
and it becomes false for d greater than or equal to four when k is equal to d plus two. So d plus two regular graphs are not always independent if and only if they're sparse. For example, the complete bipartite graph k d plus two d plus two. You can count the number of edges and vertices and I do it here, but I'm not gonna, gonna go into it. You can see the number of edges, the number of vertices and you can check sparsity by a, a little equation and it, it K66 is, is four sparse, but it's dependent. We saw that um, earlier and remember Sean gave a, a nice lecture on the Bolkarov complete bipartite graph case. And so uh, I'm not gonna worry too much about that, but the, the take home for this is that if the K regular graph has K at least D plus two, then D sparsity is not sufficient to guarantee D independence. So there's, but there's one case left. And again, I'm just flagging this up in case anyone wants to, to solve it. So the, the case is when D is free. So there, the complete bipartite graph doesn't give us a counterexample because K55 violates the free V minus six count. It has free V minus five edges. It's got 10 vertices and 25 edges. So it's free V minus five rather than six. On the other hand, when dimension is free, we know this is true. So the average degree is strictly less than six. And we also know that D plus one we were happy with for K. So the only option left is that K is a five regular graph. So here's a question. Is it true that a five regular graph is independent in the three dimensional rigidity context, if and only if the graph is free sparse? Okay. So this was conjectured in the early 2000s, but I, to be honest, I think it's provable, um, but I haven't managed yet. So I'm just throwing it out there for anyone who wants to, <coughs> to try. Well, let me um, stop for questions basically, but I, I want to re-emphasize that we have some guest lectures coming up. So this Wednesday and Friday, Bob Connolly is gonna talk about tensegrity framework. So tensegrity is instead of having the distance between every pair of vertices joined by an edge is fixed, you have some that are fixed, but some that are allowed to get shorter, but not longer, and some that are allowed to get longer, but not shorter. So you have some struts and you have some cables as well. <coughs> this gives you a generalization. And next week on the Monday and Wednesday, Lewis Ferran will give two guest lectures and his topic will be generic universal rigidity. So we haven't defined universal rigidity yet in this course. So um, Lewis will do that and he will tell you about how to understand generic universal rigidity in D dimensions. Okay, so I should stop there in case anyone has questions. So um, I do have a question about the conjecture at the end. Um, have you tried using the maximal matroid um, to determine whether it's independent there? Yes. So, in the if we replace uh, R free independence with independence in the C, I don't know which way around C one two cofactor matroid, which is the the unique maximal abstract free rigidity matroid. If you don't know what this 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 is, I, I guess don't worry. I don't want to try and go into the explanation now. But these were the ones that were studied in Bill Jackson's winter school talks at the start of this course. Um, if you do that re replacement, then you have a tool you can use to to try and solve this conjecture because we know that X replacement by um, Jackson, Clinch, and Tanigawa's recent papers that X replacement preserves independence in this matroid. So I, I did try. I don't think anyone's checked my attempted proof, so, so take it with a pinch of salt, but I believe I can prove this conjecture is true in the cofactor matroid using this operation. But okay, using X replacement is kind of a cheat for this kind of thing because I, I want to solve the 3D rigidity problem and I can't solve X replacement there, so. Yeah, okay. But I mean, it, it, as a litmus test, it, it passes the, the litmus test, I guess. Yeah, and, and a second litmus test is, I think I believe Georg has done some some computations for small graphs, and I don't think he found any counterexample when he tested huge numbers of graphs on small numbers of vertices. So we don't know of any obvious 
counterexample. Yeah, okay. All right, cheers. Thank you so much. Hey, Tony. Yeah. So you think it's provable, um, but do you mean like provable using the techniques that we've seen so far that you've demonstrated in the in the class? Oh, to, to, to resolve this conjecture? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the, the proof technique I have in mind is kind of, is recursive, but um, I, and yeah, in some sense, does use things we we've been learning about in the in the the course. But I, I I mean, I haven't I haven't proved any result to you so far that would that would get you part way to this really. Um, right, but I mean, like uh, the the basic ideas that you've shown in yeah. the various proofs. Okay. Yeah, I, I, it just might be a very tricky argument. I mean, I, I, when I say I think it's provable, I don't think I could, if you give me a week, I could just write it down and then say, here it is. But I, I sort of think that putting the, some of the ideas together we have, um, if I don't get unlucky, then, then you can make progress towards it. <laughs>